Bonsoir, messieurs et dames, euh, et bienvenue à la deuxième séance de la cinquième saison de Recherche en Lumière à l'École de Musique Sulik. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second session of the fifth uh, season of Research Alive at the Sulik School of Music. My name is Stephen McAdams, and I co-curate this series with Kit Soden, who couldn't be with us this evening because he's in Vienna. Uh, so with this series, we try to bring alive the humanistic, artistic, and uh, scientific research that's going on uh, at the Schulich School of Music, uh, including the research that goes on before performers actually get on stage and the performers themselves, and we'll have a good example of that this evening. Uh, but I basically want to remind you that our next sessions are on February 6th, when we have the two finalists from the Research uh, Alive Student Prize competition with Linda Pierce and Karin Cuellar Rendon uh, talking about music off the cuff, uh, models of early music improvisation, so another session on improvisation, and Hester Bell Jordan with a notorious lady, Nanette Streicher-Stein, and piano making in the early 19th century Vienna. And finally, on March 11th, uh, the season's student prize winner, generously funded by Jill de Villafranca and Dr. David Kustik, is flautist uh, Hannah Derrick, who will bring musical musings from the other side of the world uh, to our stage here with cultural convergences, traditional Maori flutes, and contemporary New Zealand classical music. So please join us for those. Uh, this evening's presenters are from the Improvisation Workshop Project, uh, funded by the Fonds de Recherche Québec Sciences et Culture, which is led by Jean-Michel Pilk uh, on piano. And he's also our first repeat offender in this series. And we're lucky to have three fantastic jazz musicians of world renown playing together, so including Jean-Michel Pilk, uh, Kevin Dean on trumpet, and Rémi Bolduc on saxophone. And they're going to tell us about the inner workings and musical and mental research that goes into a successful improvisation practice. So join me in welcoming our workshop project here.
I'm not going to make a phone call, just that I made a few notes uh, about what I would like, what we would like to talk about today. First of all, I'm very, very happy to present this project that is in its third year now, called the Improv Workshop Project. And the main team uh, uh, of this project uh, uh, is, uh, apart from uh, yours truly, always happy to see you, and uh, those two incredible uh, professors and musicians, yes, you can be both at the same time, for those who had any doubt. Uh, on the alto saxophone, the one and only Rémi Bolduc. <laughs> and on trumpet, the maestro himself, Professor Kevin Dean. <laughs> so uh, when, I, when I was uh, hired as a prof jazz professor, improvisation jazz, you know, you can name it different ways, but when I was, you know, uh, hired in September 2015, somebody told me, well, you should try and get grants. I was like, oh my God, okay. Uh, okay, I'll try. So uh, I, I met Stephen who told me everything there is to know about grants. It was a pretty heavy lunch. I ended up with this massive headache. Anyway, uh, but he was very patient and gave me lots of very useful information. And uh, I, I presented a grant because I thought that, you know, there was this bass player in the 60s named Charles Mingus, who was a great composer and bass player. And he did workshops, like people met every week and they just played and, you know, and that's how the music grew. And I was like, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be wonderful to do the same with like students and musicians from the Montreal scene and maybe musicians from elsewhere and, uh, and my friends here and every week just meet and improvise, you know? And so that's how the project, was created. I mean, I will pass you all the, the fine details, but uh, I got the grant to my, to my surprise because it was the very, very first time I applied. And I, I would say maybe a, a couple of things about this project that it has changed a little bit over the, the years. That the first year we met every week in Kevin's office. Now, long story short, we actually play live at Resonance Cafe, Cafe Resonance. I'm sure some of you guys know, know that place. And uh, so the project is now, we meet and we improvise in front of an audience. So that's even more interesting and of course even more scary in a way, but uh, we love to do that. And it's always different musicians. Very often people who have never played together, who don't even know each other, some classical musician, jazz musicians, uh, students, uh, young, older, I mean, all kind of backgrounds. 
And the thing that I feel like I would like to say first is that this project has taken a life of its own, which means even though the musicians are always different and the, you know, the situation is always different, it always sounds like the IWP. I don't know how, how, where it comes from, but there is this identity that's created itself mysteriously, and I think that's something to think about. I just would like to dissipate also a little confusion that people do sometimes. They confuse improvisation with jazz and vice versa. Uh, improvisation doesn't have to be jazz, and sometimes jazz doesn't, some jazz musicians don't improvise that much. So I think what we do, we just want to improvise. We just want to do instant compositions. We just want to tell a story that develops in the moment. I'm still surprised that people sometimes ask me, uh, well, uh, I'm a musician, but I don't improvise. I'm like, well, I mean, it's a bit like spending your life talking, uh, so speaking somebody else's mind, if you do that, you know? What do you do in real life? You think, and then you talk, and, and it's improvised mostly. You know, you never know one hour in advance what you're gonna say, or one hour in advance what you're gonna think, unless you're a politician, of course, or, or a lawyer. So, um, some of them don't seem to be functioning this way these days, but yeah, okay, let's not go there. So anyway, um, so improvising for me is just a totally natural phenomenon. Like, you have a thought, you say it, well, we have musical thoughts and we express them. It's a conversation, really. And like any conversation, sometimes it's great, sometimes it can be uncomfortable, sometimes it can get tricky. Not everyone has the same impression of the conversation. What we do in the project, uh, by the way, that we have this archive in provworkshopproject.com where you have all the, everything we do is shot on video, audio, high quality audio and video, so everything is documented. So you can find that on the website, you can see and hear every one of our sessions and concerts and also musicians fill journals where they talk directly about their experience doing the session. So it's very interesting to see how musicians react to the music that has been made. And sometimes you're surprised that great music can be made and then people have totally different impressions of it. So that's really like in real life, like a, I think life is improvisation and improvisation is life, to make it simple. So uh, I think it has taught us a lot of things to do this project. I know I have learned a lot and that, uh, and that uh, I think there are some thoughts that I have now, musical thoughts that are very different from before we started the, this project. The one thing that I would like to add, maybe before we play something again for you, or maybe before my, my colleagues want to say something, is that we use very, very, very simple techniques when we play. Sometimes we just play, which we just did here, which means we don't say anything, and we just sit and play and see what happens. To me, that's really uh, one of, still one of the best ways to make music. You can think about what we did afterwards and say, oh, we did this and we start like that. But in fact, it's like painting. You know, you see a canvas and it creates itself in front of your eyes. And when I'm playing with such great musicians, I feel like I know exactly what I have to do, which is why it's dangerous to use the term free. You're not free when you're inspired. You know exactly what you have to play, and so that's a great feeling. So it's really instant composition. At the end of the day, I, I feel like we're successful when we told a story that makes sense from beginning to end, with a beginning and end, a middle. Um, and to me also, it's very important that there should be some melody and rhythm in improvisation. There is this cliche, unfortunately sometimes true, that if you improvise, it's just going to be little, little, little textures and noises and all kind of stuff. I think like good old melody and good old rhythms still have lots of things to say. And when you improvise and you can use those elements and make music out of them, and there is something very satisfactory about it. So like I say, we use very simple techniques, such one that we will try afterwards with you to, to demonstrate for you. And it's really like no paper, no concepts or numerology or stuff like that. I feel like if I wanted to really resume what we do, we don't tell people what they have to play. Like sometimes, you know, some people they improvise with signs. This means you do this, this means you do that. It's great, it can give good result, but I, I don't really feel this project is about that. For me, this project is we just tell people when to play and with whom, basically. That's what we do. And from that, we have some little scenarios sometimes, like 
the one we're going to do next, where we start with three different IDs. Each of us has an ID in his head. And we start with those IDs, which of course clash, because we didn't discuss the IDs before. And then one of us, and it could be me on piano, keep a very steady ID, a very st steady musical statement. And the others, in this case will be only two, but when you have nine musicians on stage, of course it's different, will join me slowly and get closer and closer to what I do, so that at the end of the, of the thing, we get completely together in a, in a more, uh, and we build that chemistry, you know, along the course of the improvisation. So those are the kind of techniques that we use. It's really about scenarios. It's really about orchestration, telling people when to play. Sometimes we do groups. One group plays, the other one doesn't play. Very important to, and that's not easy, to know when to play and not when not to play. That's another problem with improvisation. Sometimes people play all the time and you know never stop playing. They're scared of not playing. And so that's a big thing in the project is to build a story also with silence and with people not playing, which reminds me of the fact that I'm talking way too much here. So uh, I'm going to stop here. And uh, maybe uh, if you have anything to say uh, in relation to... Just clip it, maybe this thing. Okay. So we're going to play this. I apologize in advance for Professor Dean has to leave maybe a little bit in advance because he's catching this... Uh, he's going to Mars and uh, he's catching this uh, rocket tonight and uh, he cannot really miss it because there's a very, very narrow window. Anyway, he has a plane to catch, so we will maybe leave a little bit earlier. And we're gonna do this. So we start with three IDs. We don't know what they are. Everybody has his. And I will keep something steady so that slowly but surely the tune kind of like gets to the center, which I will be, that's the role I will be playing. So it's kind of a big bang in reverse, so to speak, or you could call it maybe it's a black hole, I don't know. I like those cosmos images, so pick the one you like.
I think when one thing with the piano is that it's, it's a very big instrument, you know? I mean, it's really big. And, and what I noticed is that when I, when I play with this project, especially when we are like eight or nine musicians, uh, I feel like I, I, I have this dictatorial power. You know, they call me the benevolent dictator, but I'm not benevolent at all. That's, that's what they think, you know? Anyway, uh, and... Uh, I feel like with the piano, you can really orient the music very, very, uh, I would say, with lots of authority, which can be a problem, because if you're not paying enough attention to what the musicians are doing, if you're not really hearing what's going on, then you can really push the music in in, in, in direction that has really nothing to do with the story that's being told. And, and you know, I made I made a little analogy last time. I have this. Uh, by the way, I'm doing a little commercial. Uh, I have this uh, teaching series on Patreon, Patreon.com, uh, where for an absolutely absurd low amount of mon monthly payment, you can access some of videos where I talk about improvisation and I make all kind of parallels between life and improvisation. By the way, as I said earlier, and uh, one of those parallels is like. What is the thing that you see the least in your daily life? You know, try to think about it. Ask someone an idea. What you see like the, the least, like what do you see really almost never in your, I mean, since social media you see it a little bit more, maybe I'm helping you a little bit here, but you know, uh, what do you pretty much never see? Do you know? Nobody has any idea? Try to think. You can see your arms, you can see me, you can see the room, you can... What is it that you... Yeah? Face. You cannot see your own face. Bravo! You cannot see your brain either, but you know, that's a, that's a bit... Maybe. So you cannot see your face, right? That's the one thing that you never see, unless, of course, you spend your days making selfies, which is why I was referring to social media. So now, in music, some people spend their whole life watching their own face. Meaning, you know, they go to the piano and they're like, for example, speaking about piano. You know, every note they play, they're like, you know, absorbed by their own face, by their own, by themselves, you know. And that's exactly the reverse of real life where actually all you see is everything else, you know. Try to walk in the street with a rear view mirror and you're going to see what I mean, you know, it's not, it's going to be interesting. So people make music with a rear view mirror, like basically. So when you improvise, you cannot do that. When you improvise, you have to hear the whole of the sound, you know. The, the, yourself is actually the one thing that you should not even pay attention because you're going to hear it naturally anyway, you know. I always make the difference between hearing and listening for that. You don't need to listen to something if you hear it. You need to listen if you don't hear it, you know. So, uh, so with the piano in particular, if I pay too much attention to myself, to you know, what I play, I suddenly can make very, very strange decisions. So I have to be completely open to what's going on. And by the way I play, I can orient the music, like almost like a laser or something, but I have to be immersed in the music. I cannot be inside myself when I do that, otherwise it's gonna fail. So, uh, Maybe we, what we could try is something uh, a little bit different from what we just did, which means that they're going to play, the two of them, 
And at some point, I'm going to come up with an ID that will be derived from what they play, but I will try to make it move a little bit into another direction, but very like respectfully of what they did, you know? So it's very different from what we just did, even though it seems to be, you know, to have some similarities. And see how the music can evolve from there and the role, how the role of the piano can be clear and, you know, like I said, benevolent dictatorship, but with a sensibility to the music being made. And you will see that it, you can really get some interesting results by doing, it's almost like a lens, you know, that you use to make the light go slightly another direction. So instead of everybody going to join me, it's going to be more like the opposite. Them starting and me slightly, you know, like, diff I would say, giving a different angle to the music by the, by the means of the piano. Does that make sense, what I said? Everybody, you seem very perplexed from here, but uh, maybe, maybe it's just the light. Okay, let's try.
uh, sometimes you discover some interesting things. For example, with this, particularly with this band, but now with some others as well. I like to play standing up because uh, when you stand up at the piano, you, you don't pay as much attention to the keys, first of all. You hear the piano better because it's much better to hear it when you, your head is here rather than when it's there, that which is pretty much the worst place you can be. Also, I feel more connected to them because you know, I'm more at the same level, at the same height. And I, I feel like I'm much more projected towards the rest of the sound rather than when I'm here. I think this is a really very isolated place to play music. You know, I'm behind this huge thing and they're there and I'm, I feel like I'm hiding or something. And I have these keys like, you know, the angle is like this, whereas here it feels so small suddenly, you know, it feels like the angle is so much more human. So for sit on a chair sort of more, more your height. Yeah. yeah. Rather than stand. Yeah, yeah. For this. Oh, that's why. Okay, I, I didn't get it. Do you guys want to talk a little bit? I mean, I said well, maybe if there is uh, any question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I've talked a lot. So. I thought maybe we could have some questions uh, as we go, you know. Sure. What do oh, you think? By the way, if you want to ask questions, there is a microphone. There is a microphone around. Somewhere. Because one, we, we can hear you, and two, it's going to be broadcast, so it needs to be uh, recorded uh, some ways. Maybe not. Does anybody would have a question about what we're doing? It's all clear, right? <laughs> well, have I been too clear for our own good? This project, and I'll talk then, I'll talk a bit. This project, on my, from my perspective, is really inspiring. As uh, Jean-Michel mentioned, we had the opportunity to play with so many different type of players and uh, everybody bring a different thing and as well in my, in my own play, playing, uh, there had been some growth with this project, you know. There is, it's almost like there is some, uh, the palier stage that you go through uh, with this type of project. For me, I, I remember at the beginning, Jean-Michel would often tell us, don't overplay you know, don't play all the time. And that's often something when we have some different guests. Sometimes there is a level where some players are intimidated, so they don't play much. Then when they get more comfortable, they play maybe too much. And then they start to get more into playing with the shapes. And then you get more into playing specific notes, you know, the more you get into it. And it comes to a point where, so that was interesting for me, you know, eventually, I had to tell myself, don't play too much. And now I just usually just follow the music and it seems to happen on its own. So I got better at that. So I thought that was very uh, inspiring, something I bring in my own music, you know. And also to just go and play with such a great pianist and, uh, you know, Kevin, and we had so many great musicians, to just go there without knowing at all what we're going to be doing, what key we're in, you know. And sometimes the first note I play, I don't have perfect pitch, you know. So that first note, sometimes I'm like, oh, gee, you know, that's not what I wanted to do, you know. And, uh, but you get better at it, at really hearing the music. Uh, so that's a very inspiring project, and I, uh, I'm happy Jean-Michel put this together. He put a lot of work on, in this thing. It's like it's been a growing project, and I really appreciate it. So uh, thank you, Jean-Michel. Um, I guess I, I feel the same way. From, from my point of view, I came to the project um, with, an, with a little different experience. I had played some quote-unquote free jazz music when I was in university, when I was just playing piano, I, I, not really trumpet. And um, I enjoyed it, but I kind of eventually strayed away from it. A lot of the people that were that I was involved with that liked to play like that. I kind of felt like sometimes used it as an excuse to not really do their homework, to really, you know, learn about uh, chord changes, harmony, time and stuff. And I was more attracted to um, music that had harmony, time, swing, hard bop, bebop music. So that's kind of the direction I went. And so when I started doing this project, I was very uncomfortable. I didn't really think I had much to offer, I didn't know what to do, and I was kind of, 
I had a, my own bias about that style of music, kind of thinking, ah, oh, this is really uh, not that happening. But the more I did it, the more I realized how interesting it was and how it forced me to listen differently, to play differently, respond differently. And um, I also think it's a little different than the typical group that plays quote unquote free, because musicians that do that all the time have a tendency to gravitate more towards um, textural things, density, uh, ish stuff, um, extended techniques, not so much towards rhythm, tonality, harmony, and stuff. So the, the most of the people that, that Jean Michel has invited are more traditional jazz players that don't really do this all the time. So there's a tendency for us to gravitate towards stuff that sounds more tonal, that has a little more kind of form, if you might. Might, you might say, and also uh, jazz rhythmic uh, references. So I think it's kind of unique because we're playing free. No, nothing's predetermined, but at the same time, we all have this training in traditional jazz music that I think ref makes the, the music end up sounding differently, and I think quite nice. I mean, it's <clears throat> sometimes, you know, there's a bit of searching going on and you kind of, kind of are waiting for the, ah, they found it, you know, and then there's five minutes of, man, that's great, and then another couple of minutes while we're looking around for something. The old blind sow searching for an acorn, you know, kind of thing. But uh, generally speaking, I think, especially the last year, the results have been really, really good, and I have to say, I've, I've learned a lot from it. So uh, hats off to, hats off to uh, Jean-Michel for organizing it. Uh, thank you, I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the two of you. I know Professor Dean is now gonna leave to catch his plane to some undisclosed location. So, uh, it's not that easy to play, huh? <laughs> thank you, Kevin Dean. Thank you. And uh, are there any questions at this point, or still nothing? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hey. Um, I uh, heard. To see you, but it's oh, very, very I don't. I can't do anything no, about. No, it. I'm no, sorry. Do yeah. Anything. Um, you. I heard you speak like a year ago or something, and you said something like you were drawn to jazz as opposed to classical because like you keep forgetting things, like in your life too. You joked that like you just forget things all the time. Um, yeah, hi. Um, and um, I was wondering how you make sure when you're improvising that you're uh, not just repeating yourself, because you said you forget like all the time. So like, yeah. <laughs> how do I make sure that I don't repeat myself? Yeah, yeah, that you're not just doing the same thing over uh, and over I again. Don't, it yeah. doesn't matter. I can repeat myself. It's not a problem. I mean, uh, it, it's to me, there, there should be no limitations whatsoever to what you can do. And if you say, I should not repeat myself, that's a limitation. You know, it's like I said, improvisation is like real life. Try to imagine a real life saying, oh, I've done that yesterday, I shouldn't do it again. Then you're gonna end up with a list of things that you cannot do anymore. And basically you're gonna have to lay down on a sofa and do nothing, but that was something that you will have done also. So you, I guess you'll be really in trouble at that point. You know, you, of course we repeat ourselves sometimes, we do things Again and again, you know, it's each of us, we have a vocabulary, we have sometimes our automatisms, we have stuff that we like to play, stuff that we like to do. And I don't want to be at the piano and say, oh my God, I shouldn't do that, I've done it yesterday. Assuming that I remember, of course. Because, you know, if I do that, I'm limiting myself, I'm already punishing myself, saying, oh my God, you can... No, I want to be, you know, I want my, or or my horizon to be open, so... If I did something on Tuesday and I feel like doing it again on Wednesday, well, so be it. It's fine. It's okay. I should not have this mechanism of, you know, self-censorship that, you know, if that's something I did and that I didn't like, then maybe I'm going to censor it. But if that's something that I feel good doing and that's part of my vocabulary and I feel good doing that at that moment, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I also want to mention that I love classical music. I'm a big, 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 F, you know, I practice classical music every day, a lot, maybe a bit too much these days, by the way. And, uh, and uh, yeah, my memory is 
not great. So of course, if I had to prepare a recital, I would be uh, would have to really do some, you know, I would have to follow on the music or something. I, I, I won't do a recital. So that's cool. But uh, yeah, I regret that that you know my memory is not better and I couldn't do that, like play classical pieces and have them in my brain, have the Glenn Gould photographic memory or something. But uh, but I do love classical music and I think a lot of what I do is inspired by that. Like when we improvise, I think it's pretty obvious that sometimes I really hear things that I've heard in classical music and you know and that's the the thing that I want to repeat maybe that improvisation and jazz are two different words. You can improvise in so many idioms. I mean Indian musician improvise, I mean you have all kind of world music where improvisation is very important and you should also remember that 18th, 19th century classical composers were fantastic improvisers, like Liszt, Chopin, Schubert, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, you name them, Brahms, etc. They were all phenomenal improvisers, and there was no jazz at the time. So improvisation is, it's an age-old thing. I think it's actually the most natural thing there is in music, you know. Not the only good thing, of course, but, you know, something very natural to do. So that's why I always insist that the two should not be confused, because jazz is a more specific thing, you know, it's, it's a sp particular language, you know. Maybe I can add something. Sure. Uh, about the idea of uh, not repeating yourself. I guess my perspective is similar to Jean-Michel, but uh, I would not worry, of course, about repeating myself from one night to the other. But when we're playing tonight, it's like uh, having a conversation. You don't want to constantly repeat the same ideas, you know, you, you want to bring is something new, you know. So I, I know at one point when Jean-Michel said, uh, start something with Kevin, it's like uh, you have a musical sense of what you should be playing according to what you played before, you know. You don't want to start exactly the same thing. So I have a memory of what happened tonight, like uh, the pieces in a way, like I remember them as a suite if you want, you know. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I played something fast or something slow or something low or something high, uh, something more melodic or less melodic. So I'll do a contrast with that usually. So I have that in mind in the same concert. I don't want you hearing me playing the same thing all over, uh, all night. But maybe we play again tomorrow and maybe I'll explore some of those same ideas again. I don't know if that answers your question. And maybe uh, maybe it uh, makes me think of something else, that sometimes, especially uh, we jazz musicians have this tendency sometimes, uh, I'm guilty of it uh, like anybody else, sometimes we, 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 we are scared of keeping the same ID for a long time. You know, you have an ID and you're like, oh man, it's been 10 seconds, everybody must be bored by now, I have to switch to something else, you know. And so jazz has become a bit this thing where you, that goes 29 different different dif different directions in one minute, you know, and for me, I'm r in particular in this project, I'm rediscovering the beauty of keeping an ID for a long time, which I actually did uh, quite a few, quite a few, quite a lot tonight, you know, is because I feel like you know when you listen to Beethoven, I mean, I'm comparing myself to Beethoven, which is very modest of me, you know. Ta -ta -ta -ta, it's like the whole symphony is built on that. It's like you know uh, half an hour of that. And it's phenomenal. So Beethoven liked to keep an idea and draw on it like for like for a very long time, like what people call motivic development or whatever you name it. That was it. It was like I have this idea and I'm going to extract all I can from it. So you see, it's a it's a way of repeating yourself if you want, but with variations. And I love the idea of variation, theme and variation. So, but Remy is right. There is also a sense of some type of contrast to be had. Sometimes you don't need to change the ID, just play it differently, just play it with a different phrasing, with a different nuance. You know, when you look at, in painting, for example, when you look at artists such as Modigliani or Giacometti, they did stuff that seemed to be extremely, uh, almost the same thing again and again and again. But when you look carefully and you see the little variation, that's, wow, you know, that's where you realize the genius of the person, as opposed to someone like Picasso who could switch to one thing to something that was so there. I think that on that part there are like very different types of artists. Some artists like Monk, for example, they have one thing and they really stick to that thing and some others like to go different ways. Sometimes I tell my students, I said, well, you know, uh, you could make music 
great music with one ID and you can make great music with 25 IDs. It just depends how you use those, you know. Those are, there's not one way to make music is maybe what I'm trying to say here. There are as many different ways to make music as musician. And in this project, you really notice it because we play with so many different people, you know, so it changes all the time. That's a long answer to your question, right? I have a question. I'm very interested and intrigued by this notion of discomfort that you're talking about, uh, which Kevin and Remy both talked about, when you're starting into it. And you, so what is it, what's the nature, what, what are you uncomfortable about, and how do you then, you say that the com uncomfort went away, and so what, what is it that makes you uncomfortable? I said that? Yeah. <laughs> when you first started, you said... <laughs> You mean when I started the project? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, it, it was what I remembered was mostly I had to make an effort to find my place. It was not natural at the beginning. I tended to uh, to overplay, you know. So that's one thing. It, it was not, you know, I was not nervous or anything like that. But it's just like a, I had to get out of my way to. Like, uh, for instance, at one point, we were thinking, we were talking about this project, and we told ourselves, ourselves, when you play, don't play the first ideas, the idea that come, comes to mind, play another one after. So, y you hear something, don't play it. <laughs> play the next thing. And uh, it's, sometimes that next thing works very well, and it's... Uh, it's kind of a different way of playing because when you play jazz, it's pretty fast. Everything you don't sometimes have the time to say, "I'll play the second idea that comes to mind." You know, you're just playing. You know, it's a different vibe for me. You know, so uh, I was not maybe a discomfort, uh, not a big discomfort, discomfort, but mostly a musical uh, trying to find the exact tone uh, for the music. You know, and uh, so I had to go to that process where now I can more, you know. It's more natural for me. I kind of, I don't play if I don't hear something, and I can stand and, and just listen to the music. And if it sounds good, I don't have to play. You know, I don't feel like I have to play. I'm comfortable just listening to it. And then if I hear something, then I'll play it. But usually I try. I don't want to hear. I mean, I can hear always something. But if I hear something, that gonna bring something to the music. So if I hear everybody's playing in this E flat thing, I'm not. Oh, I I, I hear that. I'm gonna play an E flat like crazy. You know, I won't. Then, but I might hear something above that, like something else. Then I'll play. Otherwise, I won't play. You know, stuff like that. So I was not that uncomfortable, maybe, but mostly uh, looking for the right uh, perspective in the music. And does this uh, happen when you add new people in differently? That there's this moment where everybody's trying to find themselves into the, the conversation because it, Yeah, what I mean, Jean-Michel have a great thing he put together. It's that uh, when we play, especially with the bigger group, those signs, you want to explain how you do those signs? Yeah, uh, just to, to complement what Remy said first. Uh, first of all, I think discomfort is, is good. I mean, uh, like I said, improv is like li real life and if you always feel great and comfortable and everything's fine in real life, then you might have a problem, something's wrong with you. I mean, you know, who is feel comfortable all the time? Nobody feels comfortable all the time. There are moments where you're challenged, moments where you're tired, moments where you're anxious, moments where you're scared, and that's part of life. If you want to eliminate those moments, then and be happy all the time, then I guess uh, it's great. I think it would be a bit boring. So uh, in music, it's the same. You have moments where you're scared, moments where you're uncomfortable, moments where you like your heart starts speeding up and you start sweating, and you're like, I, I wish I wasn't here right now. And there are moments where, and that makes you know that makes the music interesting. You you can hear that in great music, you know, in Beethoven, in Coltrane. You can feel those moments of discomfort, anger, where people are like, wow, what, what's going on here? And that, that's part of music as much as it's part of life. So I think there's another parallel here. And the other thing is um, about playing the first idea or the second idea. That's another thing that you can do either. You know, you can have great music made completely in the moment where you don't just play the completely spontaneously what comes to you. 
That happens to me sometimes when I'm inspired and I feel like I'm on the dictation and I don't have to think about anything. So I don't try to think about the second thing. I just let the music play and, and it feels great. And what I hear, I like, you know? But sometimes in some other situation, indeed, you, you use the other technique because you start playing in the moment and something's not there. So you are like, maybe I should try a little bit, you know, maybe you play too much or there's something that's not there in terms of the pace or, and then you play, like Remy said, the second thing and then you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's good. So you see that those are different ways to do music. What I, what I do when uh, what Remy is referring to in terms of science, it's really very simple is that basically I con sometimes I conduct, so I just, basically what I say is that I just sometimes indicate tempos, but mostly I indicate who should play, you know, and, and I give signs like you should play, don't play. And sometimes we even make groups, group one, group two with an overlap, and s s this means group one plays only, group two plays only, group this, when I do this with this, this musician is going to play accompanied by group one, or this means accompanied by group two. So I give musicians c uh, cues as to who should be playing, who should be soloing, who should be not playing, etc. I basically never really tell people what they should play, like I said earlier, which means I'm not gonna do like, oh, if you do that, you have to play fast, if you do that, you have to play slow. I do it sometimes, but rarely, mostly it's more. Huh? You did at the beginning. I did at the beginning and I felt like it was very artificial because you're basically, it's like a conversation where you're trying to tell people, say this. Well, that's not what I want to say, you know, so. So maybe in a conversation where you say people, okay, it's my turn to speak, then you're next. That's more natural, you know, and uh, I feel like you have to trust the musician with whom you play. They know what they have to play, right or wrong, you know, that's on the whole of the subject, but I feel like you cannot substitute yourself to the musician. Sometimes people say, what are you expecting from a bass player? I'm like, nothing. I'm just expect expecting him or her to play the bass, basically, but I don't expect anything. I want to be surprised. I want to be challenged. I want to, if I'm the one saying you should play this or that, I see many jazz bands where the leader tells people what to play and I think it kills the music personally. I think you basically, in that case, you should play all instruments and do overdubs, you know? So, um, I'm getting angry for some reason. So anyway, uh, you, should, uh, you should really, I think, the less you tell the musicians, the better it's going to be, but sometimes conducting, orienting, like that, like Remy was said, with some science can be really creative and interesting, you know. And I feel like sometimes when we're nine or ten on stage, it's good because people tend to overplay naturally because they feel uncomfortable. So they're like, "I'm going to keep playing, and we'll see what happens." And sometimes you stop them. You just tell, "Oh, let's have the bass player take a solo," which otherwise you would never have a bass solo in that project. Nobody would ever leave the bass player to take a solo. So I stop everybody, I show the bass player and I do this, and suddenly you hear the bass by itself and everybody's like, oh. you know, you know, that's one way to direct, to direct the band, but I would never tell the bass player, you know, play some bebop and, you know, play a C sharp. And I did it a couple of times, but it's very, very, very rare. You know, I usually, the musician should be in charge. Other questions? Yep. Um, thank you. Um, I'm wondering how, uh, you mentioned that you started uh, off as a group of people in an office and then you moved to Cafe Resonance. I'm interested in how a shift in environment changed um, your, uh, your playing as a performer and also as a group and how um, like the presence of an audience or as someone who's sort of receiving, as opposed to only participants, um, change the experience of improv improvising? Well, it does. I mean, I think when you play music, everything influences you, you know? I mean, you are uh, in a certain situation, and that situation sends you a certain form of, I would, you could call it a certain form of energy, a certain form of, a certain vibe, you know? Sometimes it can be very tricky. For example, you play in a club, first set you play and there is this great vibe and you feel great and the second set everybody's like that and the vibe is gone and sometimes the same venue, same night. That's why when people say, do you prefer to play in clubs or, or rooms or... I'm like, it all depends, it changes all the time. 
I've done really good music in studios. I've done great music in life situations. I've done music that I was not happy with in both situations as well. So it really depends. I would say, though, that, and maybe that's going to be counterintuitive in a way, but that sometimes I feel like the music when you play in, the, in, the, in, in an office, so there's no audience, you're in this small room, everybody's like half an inch from the other, you know, it's very, very packed. I feel it gives the music a certain freshness, strangely. I feel like there is this, yeah, you know, we're in an office, like it's a small room, nobody, you know. And there is, there can be actually a very positive uh, effect on, on the music. I've listened to some sessions made in the office and they sound very, very natural to me. Because there's no pressure, there's nothing, there's no tension, there's you know, it's just, we're just trying things. In front of an audience, you always have that thing, oh man, if we play bad, you know, there are those people. But, you know, I mean, resonance is, is kind of laid back place. As I don't know if you know, uh, sometimes people are just surfing the web. I don't, I'm not sure they even know we're playing, so. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's also the acoustics are different. The big challenge at Resonance was to find a setup that we were as comfortable as in Kevin's office. In Kevin's office, we were so packed together, so close to each other, that it's, for music, it's great. You hear every molecule of air vibrating, so to speak. Then you're at Resonance, and you have this musician over there and that other one over there, and you're like, I, I can't relate, you know? So you have to find the right setup. The piano, of course, has an importance. Piano at Resonance is really big. Uh, and sometimes can lack some finesse or power, so you have to accommodate that. So it's different every time, really, you know. And even from one concert to another, it's totally different. So, uh, yeah. And uh, well, one thing that did change when we went from the office to playing live is that in the office there was a lot more talking, you know. So we used to play, but then what should we do and what should we not do and blah 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 and then we talk and talk was and that was the beginning right yeah, the beginning. and then suddenly we play that resonance and you, you can't really start talking about what you're going to be doing you just play and suddenly oh it, it actually sounded quite good you know a lot of things we talked about i mean the first part was good that we talked about it you know but it's funny how after we started playing with new musicians that weren't there when we we're talking about it but we were solid enough to know how to play the music and it just worked, you know. And then after, when we went back to the office, I guess we carried that mm. attitude, you know. But there was a moment, and when I play, I know, when I play in a room like here, and you guys are there, it changed my way of playing in a way that, uh, I, I, when I play, I try to, hear the music a bit from outside. So if I'm playing with a group of musicians, I'll hear what I play from their perspective. But when there is an audience, I'm adding that to that blend. You know, not only Kevin and Jean-Michel, I'm like, what's the impact of what I play on you? Because I'm, I'm trying to be out of, I don't want to, as Jean-Michel say, look at myself like this. I'm trying to project my ear so I hear the music a bit from outside and I project myself and maybe more in the room when there is an audience. I have to say, yeah, that's a very good point. And actually, I think the quantity of talking has really gone down over the course of the project, with the exception of tonight, of course. Uh, we meaning that um, it's, it's a joke. Meaning, well, it's not a joke actually. So meaning that, you know, like Remy said, when we started playing without talking, we we're like, yeah, we don't need that talk actually. You know, so the, the first session sometimes were painful because some people made speeches, you know. There were speeches between, two. yeah, music is about, and I was like, I'm not quite sure I want to do this like this. And I think it was very, salva it was our salvation to play live. And after that, the last sessions we did at Kevin office, so we haven't done quite a, quite a bit, in quite a bit, but the last ones we almost didn't talk, really. I mean, very, very little, because you realize that at the end of the day, it's improvisation. What are you going to talk about, you know? It, you have to let the music live its life, you know? And the more you talk, it's a bit like the more you tell the musician what to play. It has the same effect. It kind of like puts a damper on the music. So I think it's, it's, not, it's not 
by chance that many, many great musicians in the history of music were very inarticulate, you know, which I guess makes me a pretty bad musician because I'm so articulate, I guess. But uh, kidding. Well, I'm not sure. I'll think about that. Anyway, uh, but you know, if you ask, some people try to ask Beethoven how he wrote, they never could get anything else than some grunts, like, oh, oh, you know? Because, you know, how can you talk about that? You know, you read Chopin's letters, there is not a single mention of how he writes. He didn't need to. It was in his head, you know? So, same with Charlie Parker, with Mingus, you know, people ask them theoretical questions, and they always had some puns and some oblique answers, because, you know, it's, in, it's there. It's like asking someone, uh, how, under which uh, concept do you live your life, uh, you know? Wow, you know, you know, I'll be back tomorrow with an answer, okay? You know, so uh, I, th I think the talking really was, after a while, just off topic. Like, it was just off topic and we had to go back to the music, which we did, and the, the life situation really helped us, for sure, to do that. I think we pretty much done. I would just like, maybe, if, as a favor, to ask you, Remy, if we could play a quick duo tune. Because Remy and I are playing duo quite often. Actually, we have a concert in February. Yeah. Can't you remember the date? 18. At the Maison de la Culture uh, Côte des Neiges. And uh, we have some other concerts coming later and maybe some recording project. We'll see what happens. But uh, he's one of my you know, favorite musicians. Uh, and uh, playing with him is always something extremely special. So uh, we're going to do it for you just in a way to say goodbye. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you very much.
Just a demonstration of the great, what the great Paul Blay was a fantastic jazz pianist from Montreal used to say about improvisation because people say, how do we finish the tunes? And Paul Blay say, well, when you see an exit door, just take it. <laughs> so that's what we did. And uh, thank you so much. See you next time. Thank you.